Welcome to Expresso Engineering. I am Steve Ferguson. Join me as I guide you through the test methods of MIL Standard 461F. As we continue our journey through MIL Standard 461F test methods, today's topic will be CE 102. This is conducted emissions in the 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz frequency range and it measures voltage appearing on the power lines of the test article. This is used to determine if there is interference that could be coupled from any particular test article back to the distribution system for power and coupled onto other equipment sharing this common power bus. The uh, lines are applicable to all the test leads or, or equipment that obtains power from other than the test article itself. For example, other power sources, the bus, etc. It's applicable to all the services and agencies, so it's widely used as a test method. And the limits are provided based on the voltage that's the, the nominal voltage that's appearing at the terminals. For example, the basic curve represents 28 volts. A, a relaxation of 6 dB would be applicable to a 110 volt system. The test equipment necessary is pretty standard, a receiving system. With, they use it in the peak detection mode and uh, the right bandwidths that are selectable. Note that the bandwidth refers to the intermediate frequency or resolution bandwidth of the uh, analyzer receiving system. Quite frequently there are video filters that appear and these must be set not to limit the emissions. So video filtering must be much, much higher than the resolution bandwidth. Normally you set it to the maximum available uh, level. Uh, you need some sort of transient limiter. Quite frequently an attenuator is put in line to take care of power line transients that may appear as you connect or start the test article to prevent damage from your spectrum analyzer or your receiving system. Uh, there's a correction factor that applies to those, so it must be considered. Line impedance stabilization networks or lesions are put into place and these are used as a measurement port. And obviously there's cables associated with the measurement system, so a correction factor applies. Now we need to verify the calibration of the measurement system. That's one of our first steps once we select the hardware that will be used. Basically we need to configure it as we would, and I can go to the board and discuss this and how this process is done for a verification. Our measurement system our receiver. In our case, it's going to be a spectrum analyzer. Connects to the LISN. And obviously there's a secondary LISN for the other power line, so each lead is in fact put into play. So we have these LISNs that connect to provide power for our test article. Our EUT is a normal situation. The LISN connects to a measurement port of the LISN. The receiver connects. So our goal is to check that the LISN measurement port, cable, and receiver, and everything associated with the measurement side is in fact verified to be our calibration. The system verifies that if the correction factors that are applicable to each of the pieces are in fact added or subtracted as necessary, we get the right answer. So to do this, we are going to take away our EUT and we're going to inject a signal into the power line. We're going to inject a known signal coming into the power line through a signal generator. Inject a signal of a known voltage into the lesson. Note, make sure that power is not applied. Because if you have primary power plugged in to your signal generator, you will not last very long. It's called rapid disassembly. The, uh, so this is opened up, and we inject a signal, and we measure the signal we're injecting to make sure the receiver measures that properly. Here's a sad situation. Those signal generators we use have a 50 ohm output. And the listen is designated to be 50 ohms. So therefore, that's an impedance match through the system. In reality, at lower frequencies, the LISN is not 50 ohms. It can approach 5 ohms. 
So when that occurs, a low impedance lizen connected to a higher impedance than, it, than the lizen would cause the signal generator output level not to be what it says it is on the output meter. So we need to verify that, in fact, this thing is properly connected. So let us put something in here, a T, into the circuit to measure what we're applying. We can put an oscilloscope into the equation and measure what's going on here. Note that there's cable links that are involved here that you have to consider. The standard spells out what they are. We, in fact, measure the signal that we're producing and verify that it is the level that we targeted. What's our target level? We set a limit line, and we need to measure 6 dB below that limit line. So whatever the limit is, and let's assume, for instance, it may be 98. 98 minus 6 would be 92. So our dB microvolts would be 92. We set the signal generator to minus two, 92, excuse me, to 92 dB microvolts and see if we measure that. Now we know at low frequencies this is not 50 ohms, so we verify that the 92 is in fact measured here. Whatever we need to adjust the generator to to produce the 92 is our goal. So we're adjusting for, or we're compensating for these losses. The receiver then is used to measure by running the software. Again, if we have a limit line that comes into play, we take a particular signal and we measure it, the difference should be 6 dB. Plus or minus 3 is our tolerance for uncertainty through the system. So we see that the difference, because we targeted, we set a generator level at 6 dB below, we in fact run the software executing against the measurements for the receiver and see that it produces the right level. That's the whole calibration process in a nutshell. <laughs> in a few moments we'll be in the laboratory and look at what this means to us as we execute the program. But let's discuss going on into the measurement side of this uh, element before we continue. We almost have everything set up for measurement. Our signal generator now goes away in our oscilloscope. We're not trying to do that. And by the way, that oscilloscope we talked about gets taken out of the picture at higher frequencies. Once the lizen gets to where it is 50 ohms at frequencies, then the signal generator that we were using, let me put it back in play here, the signal generator is in fact matched, so what the meter says on its output is in fact really what we're producing. So the oscilloscope and the T circuit to connect it goes away. We don't really want to keep it in picture because it affects higher frequencies. So we produce a signal and measure these various places. They would be on out here where we're producing various signals. So our calibration is several points in our whole measurement frequency band. Now we get ready to go into the testing. We take our signal generator away and we connect our test article. Our test article comes into play. Our EUT. We now want to measure the emissions coming back here at the same measurement port. Remember we have another listen over here and we put a terminator on that item to keep everything in fact matched. 50 ohm termination here by our receiver and a 50 ohm here through a terminator. We then measure the emissions running the software and collect our data. Whatever those values are, we will get a, an emissions profile that comes out. And obviously it's over the limit. There's a, it represents a failure. We need to consider what's going on here. Ambient measurements might need to be taken. An ambient measurement would be considered when I have a failure and says, well, is that something to do with my EUT and its support equipment that may be associated with? It? So our EUT gets shut off. A terminator gets put in its place to represent the same current as the EUT. And an ambient test is done. Assuming our same limit line, if the ambient measurements all comply, then the test article is represented as being the cause of the emission. If it doesn't comply, we have issues there, we need to look at that area and figure out the problem. What's associated with our setup that causes this issue? But assuming that we pass, if we had passed to begin with, everything's happy, we don't need to do the ambient test. We do this to verify that everything is good only if there's a problem with the test results. 
we're verifying all of our system noises are in fact below the limit, at least 6 dB. So if this complies, the ambient testing is not required. If it doesn't, we simply examine the uh, outputs and evaluate the product compared to the limit. This is a test. We're not trying to solve the problem right now. It's simply a test. With that, we're ready to go to the lab and demonstrate these things that we've discussed and see if we can actually produce a passing compliant product.